All right. Thank you all for showing up. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, eleven. Oh, 12 out of the 15 people who sign up for this talk are here. So uh, I think we're in for a good turnout. Um, so yeah, my name is Eugene Tang. I'm going to be talking to you about Milvis and some of his use cases, particularly in uh, terms of scaling and for Gen AI. So um, before, so my name, yeah, so my name is Eugene. Uh, I'm a senior developer advocate at Zillis. That little QR code will get you to my LinkedIn, where you can uh, scan it and ask me any questions you might have later. Uh, those are my other links. Um, before we get into this talk. Um, just a show of hands, who here has heard of vector databases? You've heard of vector databases. Not a lot of people, okay. What about you've used a vector database, okay? Two, three, a few of you have used a vector database. One of you raised your hand for used but not heard of, okay. Um, and what about knows the internal workings of a vector database? You know how to create your own vector database, okay? Who knows how to create their own vector database? Okay, well, you're gonna learn about some of that today, so hopefully everyone's gonna get something out of this talk. So in this talk, I'm gonna be talking about four things, primarily. Uh, we're gonna start with why vector databases, why do you even need a vector database? Uh, how do vector databases work? Um, what are some of the use cases for vector database, both in Gen AI and outside of Gen AI? And then we're gonna get into the architecture. Uh, what is actually powering Milvis, which is a distributed vector database. All right, so section one, why vector databases? Basically, you use vector databases if you want to compare data that you couldn't compare before, right? So uh, show of hands, everyone's familiar with tabular data, SQL. Re re relational databases, everybody's familiar with that? Okay, uh, text search, keyword search, everyone's heard of that? Okay, cool. So. Vector databases basically power the next level, right? So semantic search is the idea behind vector databases. And the real reason that you would use a vector database or you know, why is it these are popular is because um, unstructured data is everywhere, right? So there's a bunch of structured data, SQL, relational databases that you know, we've all been working with for years and years and you know, we're trying to get you know, value out of it. But most data that businesses work with is unstructured data pictures, videos, audio, reviews, things like that. DNA, these are all unstructured data. And having uh, a way to quantify and compare unstructured data is the value add of using a vector database. So what is a vector? Um, who here knows what a neural network is? Neural networks, okay, most people are familiar with neural networks. So. What happens is if you have a deep neural network, this neural network will learn the representations of the data that goes into that network. And each layer of the network will learn something about that data. And as you go through, as the data goes through, at the end, the network will spit out some sort of guess, some sort of prediction, some sort of regression, classification on what that data is, what it means. And so what a vector is, is what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that last layer and we're gonna cut it off. So now we have the output from the second to last layer of a neural network. Uh, now, in, this is not always the case, for example, in variational autoencoders, so you would take the middle layer. Um, but in a typical neural network fashion, you take the second to last layer. And that second to last layer has all of the semantic meaning that that network has learned about your data encoded in that vector. And so that's what a vector is. And you put that vector into a vector database like Zillis or Milvis. So the way that you get a vector embedding is you take your data, any sort of data, images, PDFs, audio, video, whatever, and you put it into a vector, and you put it into a neural network, but you cut off the last layer. So you take the output from the second to last layer and you put it into a vector database. So let's do a exercise. This is an interactive talk in case you haven't noticed. And the exercise we're gonna to do today is we're going to be a vector database, okay? So here are three sentences up here. And what I'm gonna ask you to do is I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand for the sentence that uh, is the least semantically similar to the other two, okay? So first I'm gonna read the sentences. Apple made profits of 97 billion in 2023. I like to eat apple pie for profit in 2023. Adam's, 
Apple's bottom line increased by record numbers in 2023, okay? So these three are the, are the sentences we're gonna look at, and I want you to raise your hand if you think that the first sentence is the one that is the most different from the other ones. Okay, what about the second sentence? Okay, I should, okay, I should see everyone's hands go up, good. Third sentence? No, okay. So <clears throat> as humans, we kind of automatically understand that this third sentence about eating apple pie for profit doesn't seem to make sense. It doesn't fit in with the other two. But if you were to do keyword search and you were to look at profit and apple in 2023, you would actually get the first two sentences back before you get the third one because the third one doesn't include the word profit. Um, but in reality, we understand that the first and the third sentence are the ones that are the most similar, okay? So now let's take another example. We're gonna, one more exercise on being a vector database. So up here, I've got some pictures of a very, very famous celebrity, um, one of my favorite celebrities. So I would like you to raise your hand for the one that is the odd one out, the one that is not Taylor Swift, okay? So, are you guys ready? Raise your hand if you think the first one is not Taylor Swift. Okay, everyone thinks the first one is Taylor Swift. All right, raise your hand if you think the second one is not Taylor Swift. A few of you, okay, quite a few of you think the second one is not Taylor Swift. Raise your hand if you think the third one is not Taylor Swift. Okay, okay, there's some, there's some doubts here. Okay, what about the fourth one? Raise your hand if you think the fourth one is not Taylor Swift. Okay, so you guys all, it's between the second and the third, okay? So I will tell you, those of you, most of you raise your hands on the second one, and that is the one that is not Taylor Swift. So clearly, this just shows, once again, as humans, we have some understanding, some ability to see these differences. And this is the internal driver. This is essentially what a vector database is doing. It's looking for similarities between data. And so we've just done two exercises where we've acted as a vector database. So let's get into more of what this is, what's actually going on underneath the surface. What's the math? The idea behind this stuff is that you're gonna use math to quantify these relationships between entities. And now we're going to go and we're gonna look at how vector databases work. Okay, so vector similarity, uh, the, what, how we measure the similarity between these differences of data is a mathematical measure of how close two vectors are. So this is semantic similarity. This is basically what we're measuring. And this slide is, uh, this picture is a very famous picture from uh, NLP, if you guys have you know, been in the NLP field, you probably recognize this. Essentially what this slide is showing is that if you take the words, uh, if you take the word uh, queen and you subtract the meaning of the word woman and you add the meaning of the word man, you get the word king. So really the only takeaway you need from this slide is you can do math on things that aren't originally numbers using vector embeddings. But let's walk through some of this math here so we can get some sort of understanding of this, right? So, oh, one more thing before we get into this. I do think it's really, really important to make a note here. Queen and woman and king and man both have the same value on the first dimension, on the x-axis there. But that doesn't tell us anything about what that dimension means. It just tells us that these words have the same relationship along this dimension, okay? So it doesn't mean the first dimension means like gender or sex or whatever. It just means that these two words that share this value on that first dimension have the same meaning along that dimension, okay? So let's get into a little bit of the math, right? So queen is 0.3 comma 0.9, and we're subtracting woman, which is 0.3 comma 0.4, and we end up with zero comma 0.5. So this is the word, whatever this, vector is, this corresponds to the word that is gonna be the difference between queen and woman. And now once we add the word man, which is 0.5 comma 0.2, we will get 0.5 comma 0.7, which corresponds to king. So once again, the takeaway from this slide is basically vector embeddings allow you to do math on things that were not originally numbers. However, I will say in production, you will never see two dimensional vectors and you will never see Manhattan distance. This is just 
an illustration. So let's look at the ways that you can measure similarity, okay? Similarity metrics, what I'm about to show you, are just different ways that we can measure the difference between vectors. So the first similarity metric that we're gonna look at is L2, or Euclidean. So who here has taken uh, geometry? Yeah? Most people here have taken geometry? Okay, cool. Um, so this is very reminiscent of a very famous geometry formula, uh, you know, the uh, hypotenuse, right? Um, basically the difference here, a squared minus b squared kind of, so it's a1 minus a2 uh, squared plus b1 minus b2 squared, and then we basically get a hypotenuse, a distance in space. So Euclidean distance measures the distance in space, the magnitude of the difference between two vectors. The next one we're gonna look at is inner product. So inner product is the projection of one vector onto another vector. And this measures something akin to both the magnitude and the angle difference, the orientation difference between two vectors. And this is the sum of AI times BI. So uh, in the example above, uh, there, you know, it shows some math that shows you what this would be. But basically, how you can think of this is the projection of one vector onto another. So you have one vector as the leg and one vector as the hypotenuse, and it is the other leg. And then the third one is cosine similarity. And cosine similarity looks very similar to IP, but it's a lot more complicated on the bottom. It's just inner product divided by the, mag the product of the magnitude of the vectors. And what this measures is just the angle between two vectors, okay? And um, if you have normalized vectors, if all of your vectors have a magnitude of one, measuring inner product and measuring cosine is the same, and you should always use inner product because it is less calculations. Okay, so let's recap here, right? Euclidean, Euclidean distance is used if you want the magnitude, the spatial distance between two vectors. Cosine is if you want the difference in orientation between two vectors. An inner product will give you some combination of both. And if you are working with normalized vectors, you should use inner product over cosine. Okay, now let's look at indexes. Indexes are the ways that we organize how we access our data. So the first index, this is the most intuitive index, I think, it's called inverted file index, it's called IVF. Um, and this is an illustration of what that might look like in two dimensions. And this is essentially a clustering index. All we're doing here is we're clustering a bunch of vectors in space and finding the centroids. At search time, what you do is you search the, you find the closest number, closest centroids, you pick a number, maybe like three. You find the closest three centroids to your search vector, and then you go into those centroids, into the, the, the I guess, the relative space, the, the vectors that are inside of those areas that are related to those centroids, and then you find the closest vectors to your vector from those centroids. So inverted file index, what we end up doing is we keep, it, we keep all the centroids in memory, and so this memory, is a, it's a memory reduction over having all of the vectors. And then what happens is when we search only a subset of the vectors, so uh, the search accuracy may not be 100% because you might miss some if you have a lot of uh, centroids and you're only searching like, uh, you know, 1% one, 1 of them, you might miss some. But uh, the trade-off there is that it's faster and it takes less memory and it's relatively accurate. Next we have HNSW, which is a hierarchical, hierarchical navigable small worlds. Uh, so what this does is this creates a graph index. And this will create, this what ha the way this is created is you have your empty graph and then you go through all of your vectors and you start inserting vectors into the graph. And each vector is gonna know, each insertion into the graph, each node is gonna know which vectors are closest to it. And it's also gonna have a link up to the next layer. So how do we determine whether a vector is gonna be in the base layer or the layer above? What we use is, um, well, 
It's called an exploration factor, but I don't think that's a really good name. I think it's better to understand it as, let's say, what we're gonna do here is we're actually gonna, every time you input something into the graph, you're gonna calculate a uniform random uh, number. And if that uniform random number is above a certain threshold that you get to set, this is a hyperparameter that you set, then it gets put into the next layer. So let's say our, our threshold is 0.9. If your uniform num random, random number is 0.7, then it goes into layer zero. If it's 0.95, then it goes into layer one. If it's 0.999, then it goes, or 0.995, then it goes into layer two. And every, um, every point goes into layer zero. It's the uniform random number uh, just determines what, how far up it goes. Then at search time, we search the highest layer. So we have a very sparse initial search space. And because we already know what uh, vectors are closest, what we do is we just drop to the next layer, look for the closest one out of the closest uh, in the highest layer, that's the, then the closest to our search vector, and we just continue all the way down until we get to the last layer. So HNSW is really good because it has a near 100% accuracy rate, as in if it returns a vector, that vector is likely to be the closest vector. But the trade-off is that you have to keep a lot more vectors in memory because you have to keep a lot more things in memory because now you have more vectors to keep in memory in the layers, and you also have the edges of the graph. So some of the ways that you kind of balance out some of this stuff is uh, quantization. And we're gonna talk about two quantization methods. Uh, the first one is scalar quantization. And quantization is really just a fancy term for bucketing, right? So who's familiar with real numbers and integers? Everybody? Okay, great. So you can think of quantization as basically, hey, we've got these real numbers, but we don't want to work with real numbers, let's just work with integers. So it's the projection of the reals onto the integers is one way to think about it. Uh, it's not the exact way, but let's say, you know, like instead of 0.5, now you have, or instead of 0.4, now you have zero. Instead of 0.7, now you have one, okay? That's the basic idea behind quantization. And you can also do this in product quantization. So not only across your vector can you make things like um, bucketed, but you can also look at the entire range of um, values and bucket across the entire range of values in a column as well as in a row, okay? And then this, what this does is this scales down the amount of memory you have even more, right? So if uh, scalar quantization was to reduce your memory by eight times, product quantization would would reduce your memory by 64 times. And the trade-off for both of these is that you don't have as accurate of a search space because now you have a less fine-grained search space. So how do we deal with that? We can actually combine SQ or PQ, scalar quantization or product quantization, with the other indexing methods, with IVF or HNSW. And we see this as a common application on Milvis. So just overview here, IVF, intuitive method, pretty good results, doesn't take up a lot of memory. HNS, HNSW, graph-based me uh, method, takes a lot of memory, really, really performant, really, really good results. Flat, that's just brute force, that's just, hey, I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna search every vector. Memory, no change in memory, pretty slow, but 100% performance, 100% retrieval, 100% accuracy. Scalar quantization, product quantization, just different ways to bucket your data so you have less data in memory and your trade-off there is accuracy. So vector databases are ways you can efficiently store, index, and relate entities by quantitative values. So what are some use cases for vector databases? Before we get into this, let's talk a little bit about what an entry into a vector database looks like. What does vector data look like? The only two rows that you need in each vector data entry here are the first two rows. The ID, so that you can make sure that you get a vector by the ID, and the embedding, which is the actual vector itself. So these are the only two things that you need, and the ID is the way that you basically, you know, you query as if it's a key, and the vector embedding is how you do relational, like how do I find the most semantically similar data. So these are the two important things, and then everything else is what we call metadata. And metadata is actually very, very important when you are working with vector databases, because when you do RAG, who's heard of RAG? 
Okay. So RAG, so some of you haven't heard of RAG. RAG is Retrieval Augmented Generation. It is a very, very popular use case of vector databases right now. And one of the things that you need with RAG is you need to have some metadata that represents the actual text that is being embedded, okay? So metadata can be used to pass more information along for downstream processes, or, or I guess, and it can be used for filtering. So for example, maybe you want something that was at, published at a certain date, or is a certain reading time, or has a certain number of claps. This is data from Medium, so that's why it has that on there, okay? So, oh, and uh, I, I jumped ahead of myself here to talk about RAG. So RAG is one of the generative AI use cases for vector databases. And essentially what you're doing with RAG is you're forcing data injection onto the LLM by using your vector database as your knowledge store. So you're injecting your data, you're taking your data, you're embedding it, and you're putting it into a vector database, and then when it comes to query time, you ask the LLM, hey, you know, tell me about ABC. What is the size of Seattle? How many people live in Seattle? And the vector database will go, it'll go into the vector, oh, sorry, the LLM will go, it'll go into the vector database, and it'll say, oh, hey, you know, this vector database says Seattle has 750,000 people. I can see the embedding. I'm going to get the embedding. I'm going to query it back. I'm going to pipe the text back, and I'm going to give you a response. The city of Seattle has 750,000 people as of 2022. So that's an example of RAG. And the basic use case is fact, factual recall. It enhances uh, the ability of the LLM to interact with your data. Um, and it's cost optimized. Instead of having to continuously uh, train stuff, which you will eventually fine tuning is something that you would like to do. But uh, for basic processes of using an LLM on your data, RAG is a really good starting point. So here are some other common AI use cases for vector databases. The first one is RAG, LLM Augmented Retrieval. Um, you know, recommendation systems, uh, semantic search over different text documents, video similarity, image similarity, audio similarity, multimodal search, molecular search, all of these different ways that you can search data in ways you couldn't search data before is the, are the set of the main applications of vector databases when it comes to AI generative or not. Okay, so now I've got a bunch of example notebooks. Uh, who here actually writes code? Oh, a bunch of you, okay, great. So, you know, if this is, uh, if you guys are writing some code, these will be helpful for you. Um, scan the QR code, it'll take you to a GitHub repository with notebooks on how you can do some example uh, projects. So this project is an example project where we use uh, a, a computer vision model to segment out the clothes that some people are wearing, um, and then you can compare like where the most similar pieces of clothing. And so this uses Milvis as your vector database there, and it uses ResNet 50 as well as a SecFormer to um, compare the, the, the different clothes that people are wearing. This one, very similar, except instead of using a SecFormer, we're using ResNet 50 to compare different art pieces. So this has a bunch of Renaissance artists, and uh, I've also thrown a bunch of paintings by Salvador Dali in here. You can see these two paintings by Salvador Dali, as well as I believe that's the Sea of Galilee uh, up there. Um, and this is another image recognition use case, uh, image recognition notebook, and you can use as a practice notebook to play around with factor databases. And now we have a text one. Of course, RAG is primarily done through text right now, although I do have a course coming up on how to do multimodal RAG with LinkedIn. Um, if you would like to know how to do text, you just scan this QR code. It'll take you to a notebook that shows you how to build a uh, RAG um, example over, um, this one's actually on the Nightmore, Nightmare Before Christmas. Um, who's seen that movie? I actually haven't seen that movie, so. Um, but yes, this is a you know, popular movie, fun example. It was a really good Halloween example that I did last year. And this one also includes citations, which will tell you where in the data that your uh, data is coming from so that you know, like, hey, this the example, the LM is getting data from a real data source. And I don't have any pictures for this one, but AI agents has been an incredibly popular um, 
has been an incredibly popular topic over the past, I don't know, month or so, two months, I'm not really sure. But AI agents has become incredibly popular recently, and I built some AI agents, and this one shows you how you can build some AI agents. This is not necessarily vector database related, this is just a GitHub repo of a bunch of AI agent projects. Um, so yeah, that's the end of the use case session for vector databases. Now we're gonna jump into the architecture. Um, before we get into the architecture, I'm just gonna cover a few like very simple things very quickly. There's a lot of text here, I'm not gonna read it. Um, why would you use a vector database instead of a SQL database or a NoSQL database? The basic reasoning is that vector databases, vector database is a misnomer. Vector databases are not real databases. They're actually compute engines that, st that sit on top of a uh, layer of storage. And so SQL databases, NoSQL databases, can you use them? Yes, you just have to build a compute engine on top of it. Um, so basically, if you want to try to use a vector database with one of these, if you want to try to use one of these natively to do vector search, it's going to be too computationally expensive. You need to build your own compute engine on top of it. Okay. Uh, vector search libraries, who's heard of vector search library? Who knows about face? Not enough of you know about this for me to care about this. Okay, so Milvis and Zillis. So Milvis is the project that we work on at Zillis. Milvis is the only distributed uh, vector database that currently exists. And the reason for that is because back in 2021, we had a customer come to us and basically they were like, hey, we've got five trillion vectors can we use your product to do vector search at that scale? And we were like, no, but we'll go build that for you. And so that's why we have a distributed vector database that's focused on scale. And we have a bunch of, you know, we have a bunch of features for it. Um, advanced filtering, hybrid search, metadata filtering, role-based access control for enterprises. Everyone knows enterprises love that. Um, and then one of the interesting things that's actually incredibly difficult to do is uh, consistency, write consistency at scale. So how many people here have worked on databases, like worked on loading them in production? One, a few of you, okay. So, so some of you have probably come across this problem of how do I write consistently to my different, to the different instances and replicas that I have? And one of the things that, that was one of the problems that we ran into anyway, and so Milvis has actually built in this manner, which is a very confusing architecture diagram that does not really show things very well, but it is a pub sub system. And that is how we handle consistency at scale, is that what we do is we model uh, the entirety of data writing in Milvis as a pub sub system. So what happens is you have a message queue with shards that will write, and then they will write in general, and then the different uh, uh, nodes that read in that data will subscribe to that log, and it will pull in that data, and it will handle that consistency for you. Um, and there are multiple consistency levels depending on what you need. We have strong consistency, which is basically uh, enforced read after write, and then we have eventual consistency, which is just, eh, you know, uh, as the instructions come in over the network, they get, they get executed. And there are different use cases for each of these, right? Sometimes you need read after write if you're working on something that has, you know, very sensitive to the order of things, and sometimes you don't. Um, the other thing, the thing that is probably one of the most important things to note from this diagram is that there are three different kinds of worker nodes. There's a query node, a data node, and an index node. So the reason why there are three kinds of nodes here is because when it comes to search, you have three different separations of concerns. You want to be able to query your data, search your data. You want to be able to load in your data, that's the data node. And then you want to be able to index your data, which is how do I create ways to access my data efficiently, right? We looked over those indexes earlier. So these three things never scale at the same time. It is almost, well, I mean, I'm not gonna say it's impossible, um, but it is almost impossible that you're going to be reading in the same amount of data that you're querying for and the same amount of data that you're indexing for. And if that happens, we can handle it. But primarily, we have a very flexible scaling system because A, saves uh, costs, 
And um, well, that's the main reason. It's very efficient. It's resource efficient. And so we can do that with uh, different uh, nodes for each uh, of these concerns. And then um, another important thing to note that is not on here is that Milvis indexes over small segments. And so we'll do another thought exercise real quick here, right? So uh, instead of searching 100 gigabytes in a linear fashion, we can search, let's say, 100 one gigabyte blocks in parallel. And you can kind of just think about the big O of this, uh, of, of executing this kind of task and think you know, which one is faster. So obviously having a consistent, uh, basically you can think of search over one gigabyte to be constant time and then parallel to be uh, you know, based on your network and latency stuff, you can think about that. That's not going to be a lot of time added as opposed to a linear um, big O. So parallelization over that is something that is very good for large amounts of data. And the other added benefit of that is that if you update your data a lot, you need to update your index. So if you are only going to put, put data in once, it doesn't really matter. You just put in data once, you're not going to have to update your index. But if you have data that continuously is coming in, as we all do in the real world, you're going to need to continuously update your index so that you have an efficient search. So that's pretty much it. Uh, if you want to get started with Zillow's Cloud, get started with Zillow's Cloud. Otherwise, that's the end of my talk, and I can take some questions. Any questions? Yes, sir. You can, pull the, you can specify what extra data you want to pull, but the reason why we have the ID, you have to have the ID, is because you have no other way of deleting data. Uh, so the ID is mainly for deleting or upserting new data. And then actually, Milvis has recently added multi-vector multi, uh, multi search. So now you can have different embeddings. You can create different indexes over different embeddings to do that search. Um, but the reason why we have this is because it is just more effective to be able to access all your data in one place rather than having to map Let's say, like in you know, you know, if you think about SQL databases and like normal form, instead of having to you know get your embedding and then map your normal form based on your ID to another place, it's just more effective to have everything stored in one place. Kind of like NoSQL, right? That's kind of like the idea behind that. Um. Can you rephrase that? Like, you mentioned that like, the embedding for the vector is just the second to last layer, it's like the input to the embedding. The output of the second to last layer, yes. Okay. Yes. Have you ever like, finished both of them on the last layer? Um, the reason why you would use the second output from the second to last layer and not the last layer is because the, last layer of, the output of the last layer of a neural network uh, is a prediction. And instead of having a prediction, what you actually want is you want the semantic representation. Therefore, you can actually compare these kinds of different kinds of uh, uh, data. So actually, in reality, you can use whatever you want for the vector embedding. This is just what is suggested uh, based on the existing research. Yes? What is the what? What, what is the difference between Elasticsearch? Um, I, 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 I actually don't know how Elasticsearch works. Um, but Elasticsearch has said that they do vector search now. Um, the only uh, difference that I've seen is um, performance at scale. Um, so Elasticsearch works really well for some sort of like keyword, like fuzzy search. And I, I'm not entirely sure what they're doing there. I think it's probably something to do with lemmas. Um, but uh, it's a fundamentally different way to search your data. 
And so um, from what I understand, and I might be wrong about this, so I don't want to talk too much about what Elasticsearch does, but uh, Elasticsearch doesn't necessarily compare, well, they've added recent functionality to compare vectors, but prior to this, they did not compare the vectors. And the main challenge then is just how do you scale such high amounts of compute? Um, and so Milvis has always been a, a, a vector native vector database. Um, and so it does something slightly different uh, underneath the surface. Everyone understands everything about vector databases? You guys could give this talk now? Great. Thank you. Thank you.